Hello, I'm Jonathan Kay, Professor of Medicine and Director of Clinical Research in the Division of Rheumatology at the University of Massachusetts School of Medicine in Worcester, Massachusetts. Welcome to Rheumatology Highlights Report. Over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to highlight several presentations from a recent national meeting on osteoarthritis and miscellaneous rheumatic disorders. I'm going to discuss a trial of long-term diet and exercise for osteoarthritis, two studies of interleukin-1 inhibition as treatment for autoinflammatory disorders, and finally, discuss the association of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy with immunosuppressive therapy in autoimmune rheumatic diseases. The Intensive Diet and Exercise for Arthritis, or IDEA trial, was a prospective single-blind randomized controlled trial of three 18-month interventions in 454 overweight and obese older adults with knee osteoarthritis. Patients were randomized to receive either intensive dietary restriction only, the combination of intensive dietary restriction with exercise, or an exercise-only control group. Patients were required to experience pain and had to have had radiographic evidence of tibiofemoral osteoarthritis, kelgren lawrence grade 2 or 3, which is joint space narrowing and osteophyte formation, but not bone on bone. 85% of the patients enrolled had bilateral knee osteoarthritis. The weight loss goal was at least 10% of the baseline body weight. The exercise intervention was low to moderate intensity walking and resistance training three days a week for an hour a day. And an intent to treat analysis was performed to compare changes between groups at the 18-month follow-up visit. 399, or 88% of the participants, returned for the final 18-month follow-up testing. Weight reduction occurred primarily in the group's in which diet was employed and occurred within the first six months and was largely maintained and even increased slightly over the subsequent 12 months. The mean weight reduction in the diet alone group was 9.5% at 18 months. In the diet with exercise group, it was 11.4%, but in the exercise alone control group, weight loss was only 2.2% of baseline. All patients experienced a reduction in pain over time, with the reduction occurring most markedly within the first six months of the study. However, by 18 months, there was further reduction in pain in the group treated with diet combined with exercise, whereas the reduction in pain plateaued and remained similar to that at six months in the groups treated with diet and exercise alone. Womack physical function decreased within the first six months in all three groups, but again was statistically significantly superior in the diet with exercise group to either group treated with diet or exercise alone. Walking speed improved within the first six months in all three groups, but was statistically significantly greater in the diet with exercise group compared to either the diet alone or exercise alone group at 18 months. There was no statistically significant difference between groups on the SF36 physical or mental health scales. This study showed that long-term intensive weight loss is possible in patients with knee osteoarthritis. After 18 months, intensive weight loss combined with low to moderate intensity exercise resulted in a 50% reduction in pain and significant improvements in function and mobility. Thus, Long-term intensive diet combined with moderate intensity exercise is the best recommendation for symptom reduction in overweight and obese persons with knee osteoarthritis. The first of the two studies addressing interleukin-1 inhibition in patients with autoinflammatory diseases looked at relonisept treatment of colchicine-resistant familial Mediterranean fever. This was a randomized, multicenter, double-blinded, alternating treatment phase two trial. Relonisept is a fusion protein combining the extracellular domain of the interleukin-1 type 1 receptor with the constant region of the heavy chain of the human IgG1 immunoglobulin. This fusion protein binds interleukin-1 and prevents interleukin-1 from binding to its cognate receptors on the cell surface. Goldfinger and colleagues showed in the 1970s that colchicine prevents recurrent attacks of familial Mediterranean fever, or FMF. 
However, for patients with FMF whose disease is resistant to or do not tolerate colchicine, there's no proven alternative treatment. FMF is an autosomal dominant hereditary condition involving a mutation in the pyrin gene that leads to recurrent attacks of fever and serosal inflammation. Since pyrin has an important role in the regulation of interleukin-1-beta, the investigators hypothesized that interleukin-1 inhibition might decrease the number of attacks of familial Mediterranean fever. The purpose of this study was to determine specifically if relonisep decreases the number of FMF attacks compared to placebo. In this study, patients with FMF four years of age or older with at least one attack of FMF monthly, despite adequate doses of or intolerant to colchicine, were enrolled. All patients received two three-month courses of relonisept at 2.2 milligrams per kilogram subcutaneously weekly and two three-month courses of placebo. The courses of relonisept and placebo were randomized to one of four treatment sequences shown here, either alternating or flanking two courses of the other drug. Patients with at least two attacks within a single course were allowed to switch arms with maintenance of blinding. The primary outcome of this study was the difference in frequency of FMF attacks between patients treated during relonisep courses and placebo courses. 14 patients, eight male and six female, were randomized at six United States sites. Patients were relatively young with a mean age of 24.4 years. They had relatively long disease duration, a mean of 17.5 years. And patients at baseline had a mean of three FMF attacks per month. 11 patients completed 12 months of the study and three discontinued early. Responders were defined as those who had at least a 40% difference in the frequency of FMF attacks. There were eight responders and the mean number of attacks monthly among 12 patients who completed at least two treatment courses was one attack per month in those treated with relonisep compared to two attacks per month among those treated with placebo. Thus, the risk ratio for attacks comparing relonisep to placebo was around 0.6. Injection site reactions occurred significantly more frequently with relonisep, but there were no differences in other adverse events, including infections. Thus, relonisep is a promising alternative treatment for FMF in patients either intolerant to or resistant to colchicine prophylaxis. Schnitzler syndrome is another autoinflammatory disease, but one without a genetic predisposition. There have been about 100 cases of Schnitzler syndrome reported in the literature, and these patients have a chronic urticarial rash that lasts for anywhere from 4 to 36 hours or even longer, associated with the presence of a monoclonal IgM or IgG gammopathy. These patients also have other clinical features, including intermittent fever, joint pain or arthritis, bone pain, lymphadenopathy, organomegaly, elevated acute phase reactants, leukocytosis, and increased bone density on plain radiographs or histological abnormalities in bone. Other causes of similar symptoms, such as cryopyrin-associated syndrome, including familial cold urticaria, Muckle-Well syndrome, and other conditions must be excluded before establishing a diagnosis of Schnitzler syndrome. Anakinra, interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, which is administered subcutaneously daily, has been shown to be effective treatment in over 40 patients with Schnitzler syndrome. However, the Frequent dosing and occurrence of injection site reactions with anakinra limits its tolerability among patients. Canakinumab is a monoclonal antibody against interleukin-1 beta, which can be administered only once every four to eight weeks. Canakinumab has been shown to be effective in cryopyrin-associated periodic syndrome, which is phenotypically similar to Schnitzler syndrome. Thus, this study was undertaken to determine the long-term safety and efficacy of canakinumab and Schnitzler syndrome. This was a six-month open-label trial conducted at Nijmegen in the Netherlands in which eight patients with Schnitzler syndrome were given canakinumab 
150 milligrams subcutaneously every four weeks. The six males and two females enrolled were in the older age group and had Schnitzler syndrome for five to 25 years duration. They had been asymptomatic on daily anakinra injections for four months to seven years and were required to stop anakinra treatment at study entry, uh, and they began the study at the moment when their symptoms recurred. Three days after receiving the first injection of canakinumab, patients experienced partial response or clinical remission. By day seven, three of the patients experienced a complete remission, four experienced clinical remission, and one had a partial response. The primary outcome of the study was achieved by all patients at day 14, that being a clinical or complete remission. However, by day 28, one of the patients had relapsed and dropped out of the remainder of the study. The CRP concentration dropped dramatically within the first week of the study and remained lower undetectable for the remainder of the study period. There was one serious adverse event, that being the death of a patient in a traffic accident 45 days after the last dose of study medication. This was deemed to be completely unrelated to study drug. There were 18 adverse events occurring in five patients, and of the 18 adverse events reported, only rhinitis, pharyngitis, and lightheadedness, which occurred in two patients each, were other than the unique adverse events. Thus, this study showed that monthly canakinumab injection is an effective long-acting treatment for Schnitzler syndrome. Progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy is a demyelinating central nervous system infection that's caused by reactivation of the JC virus in individuals with immunodeficiency or compromised T cell function. This has been observed to occur in patients treated with immunosuppressive therapy for autoimmune rheumatic diseases and has been rapidly fatal in most cases, leaving major deficits in those who survive. Patients with lupus may have a unique susceptibility to PML, irregardless of the underlying treatment that they're receiving. Recently, there's been an association of PML with several biologic therapies, notably rituximab and anti-TNF therapy. This study from the Cleveland Clinic, conducted by Eamon Malloy and Leonard Calabrese, examined the aggregate experience of PML reported in association with autoimmune rheumatic diseases in the FDA Adverse Event Reporting System database updated through March 31, 2010. In their study, PML was defined and classified as being confirmed if there were characteristic changes on MRI, those being T2 hyperintensity at the junction between gray matter and white matter in the brain, and if JC virus was detected in brain tissue or CSF. They found 34 cases of PML reported among patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases. The majority, 17 cases, were reported among patients with systemic lupus erythematosus, but 10 were reported in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. An additional four were reported in patients with vasculitis and three in dermatomyositis patients. Most of the patients with lupus had been treated with synthetic DMARDs only, but five had been treated with biologic agents. In contrast, seven of the 10 patients with rheumatoid arthritis, as would be expected, had been treated with biologic agents, and only three had been treated with synthetic DMARDs only. In the biologic-treated patient group, 14 patients had been treated with rituximab, and all 14 were on rituximab at the onset of PML. In contrast, of the six treated with anti-TNF therapy, only one was still taking anti-TNF therapy at the onset of PML. These patients had been treated previously or concurrently with other non-biologic DMARDs, including the alkylating agent cyclophosphamide and other non-biologic DMARDs, including azathioprine, methotrexate, mycophenolate mofetil, and lufunamide. Four rituximab-treated patients were receiving no other immunosuppressive therapy at the apparent time of onset of PML. All other biologic-treated patients were also receiving at least one synthetic DMARD. Three biologic-treated patients, two on rituximab and one on infliximab, were concomitantly receiving cyclophosphamide at the time of onset of PML. 
three additional rituximab-treated patients had previously received cyclophosphamide. There were two rituximab-treated patients who previously received chemotherapy for malignancies, one for oropharyngeal cancer and the other for a malt lymphoma. One case of PML had been exposed to anakinra two years prior to the onset of PML, but no confirmed PML cases have been associated with the use of either tocilizumab or abatacept. Among the patient group treated with synthetic DMARDs only, the majority of these had been treated with an alkylating agent, 12 with cyclophosphamide and 2 with chlorambucil, and 6 of these patients were taking the alkylating agent at the onset of PML. Among the others, about half of those treated with azathioprine, methotrexate, mycophenolate, mofetil, and the patient treated with lufunamide were taking the synthetic DMARD at the time of PML onset. These data suggest that progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy is a concerning signal emerging with rituximab in patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases. However, this is a very rare complication. Only six cases have been reported in rituximab-treated patients with rheumatoid arthritis among 168,000 rheumatoid arthritis patients treated with that drug. Thus, the incidence is less than one in 10,000 patients. However, ongoing vigilance is still required, especially among patients previously or currently exposed to an alkylating agent. There are a paucity of unconfounded confirmed cases of PML in patients treated with anti-TNF agents, and this association is yet to be firmed up. There's no clear signal for mycophenolate mofetil above that seen with other biologic agents. In conclusion, all patients treated with immunosuppressive therapies for rheumatic disease should be considered potentially at risk for PML. Over the past few minutes, I've reviewed four trials, one of long-term diet and exercise for osteoarthritis, two of interleukin-1 inhibition as treatment for autoinflammatory disorders, one in familial Mediterranean fever and the other in Schnitzler syndrome, and finally discussed the association of PML with immunosuppressive therapy in rheumatic diseases. I appreciate your joining me and hope that if you have another 15 minutes, you'll choose to participate in one or more Rheumatology Highlights reports online. Give us 15 minutes and we'll bring you the world of rheumatology. Thank you very much for your attention.